President Barack Obama did as many have before him, wrapping up his presidency with a final farewell. He highlighted the victories during his time in the Oval Office, called on citizens to uphold democracy and have faith in their future. His speech took an emotional turn as he spoke about the first family. You took on a role you didn't ask for, and you made it your own with grace and with grit and with style and good humor. An emotional President Barack Obama wiped away tears as he honored the role his wife Michelle took on as First Lady. He went on to speak about his most important job, father to daughters Malia and Sasha. Of all that I have done in my life, I am most proud to be your dad. The president returned to Chicago's McCormick Place to deliver his final farewell. It's the same location where four years ago he gave his 2012 election night acceptance speech. Early on, he was interrupted by chants from the crowd. I can't do that. For nearly a decade, it seemed like Washington sent conservative Christians to wander in the wilderness. Now they feel a sense of deliverance. The Christians are being treated horribly because we have nobody to represent the Christians. And since winning the election, he's appointed one conservative Christian after another to his cabinet. I will be the greatest representative of the Christians that they've had in a long time. And now the vast majority of evangelicals who helped send Trump to the White House are ready to reap their rewards. Those include the appointment of pro-life Supreme Court justices and the banning of late-term abortions. The baby in the womb that has all its vital organs, has, uh, has eyelashes and fingernails, can hear and respond to its mother's voice and feel pain, deserves legal protection as a member of our human family. And he's agreed to sign that into law. There's also an expectation the new president will enforce the constitutional right for Christians to live their faith and obey their conscience. It's an issue that led to a historic turnout on election day. Christians wished it was a joke when the U.S. Civil Rights Commission issued its September report on religious freedom. Commission Chairman Martin Castro wrote, the phrases religious liberty and religious freedom will stand for nothing except hypocrisy so long as they remain code words for discrimination, intolerance, racism, sexism, homophobia, Islamophobia, Christian supremacy, or any form of intolerance. By using language that suggests that Christians who object or who want accommodation are just by definition bigots um, is very wrong and dangerous. It's a frustration that has turned to relief with the new arrival of an advocate in the White House. A group called Hashtag Disrupt J20 is planning protests in cities nationwide on January 20th. The protests in Washington will receive the most attention if the protesters' plans succeed. Operation Cluster, explicative deleted, has plans to make the inauguration in D.C. an absolute nightmare. The first part of the plan invokes blocking all of the major ingresses into the city, especially from the south. And the second component involves protesters blockading each checkpoint to make it difficult for people to attend. When President Barack Obama took office eight years ago, he vowed to end the wars that his predecessor, George W. Bush, had started. But he can't claim complete success. And forget the wars we know that we're involved in. A new study shows that under Obama, the U.S. has dropped thousands of bombs on countries the nation isn't currently at war with. Although President Barack Obama has cut down the number of boots on the ground in Afghanistan and Iraq, his administration has increased air wars across the globe. As co-founder of the peace group Code Pink, Medea Benjamin notes in her article in The Guardian, while candidate Obama came to office pledging to end George W. Bush's wars, he leaves office having been at war longer than any president in U.S. history. He is also the only president to serve two complete terms with the nation at war. Now, a new study done by the Council on Foreign Relations shows under the Obama administration, the U.S. dropped a little over 26,000 bombs in the year 2016. Now, that's 3,000 more than the number of bombs dropped in 2015. 
Now in Syria and Iraq were bombed the most. The U.S. dropped 12,192 bombs on Syria, 12,095 bombs in Iraq, 1,000 in Afghanistan, almost 500 in Libya, 34 in Yemen, 14 in Somalia, and 3 in Pakistan. Now that's totaling 26,171 bombs. That's an average of 72 bombs a day. Now, the U.S. president has permitted more than 10 times the number of drone strikes than former President George W. Bush. These U.S. fighter jets are releasing a swarm of micro drones. Hard belief. They're called Perdix Micro Drones, and they were originally developed at the MIT Lincoln Lab. They're meant for intelligence, surveillance, and recon. 103 3D printed drones were deployed from FA-18 Super Hornets in October. This is what the swarm sounded like. The drones were given missions and the swarm was able to perform collective decision-making and fly in formation. It was the largest swarm ever tested by the Department of Defense. Perdix aren't weaponized, but the U.S. isn't ruling out attack swarms for the future. Meanwhile, the United States has briefly stationed its troops in Poland as part of an ongoing NATO operation to deploy forces along Russian borders. Now, the troops landed in Rokla in southwestern Poland. Nearly 2,800 tanks and other pieces of U.S. military hardware are also being transferred from Germany. Several U.S. senators have introduced fresh sanctions against Russia for allegedly interfering in a U.S. presidential election. Punishments include visa bans and financial asset freezes against those determined to have carried out cyber attacks against U.S. democratic offices. The bill is also partly against Russia's actions related to Syria and Ukraine. It would impose mandatory sanctions on Russia's vast energy sector and on companies that help develop its civil nuclear projects. And finally, Russia has criticized the proposed U.S. Senate bill to impose further sanctions on Russia over allegations that it interfered in the November 8th election. Kremlin spokesman Dmitry Peskov said the measure is an attempt to prolong the harm already done to Washington-Moscow ties. Navy spokesperson Yang Yang said the drill tested coordination between naval vessels and aircraft and was a regular part of the annual training plan. He said the event did not target any specific nation, region or objective and was in line with international law and practice. This always seems foreign to Americans. The vast majority of police officers in Britain are unarmed. But if Her Majesty's government has its way, the Bobbies will soon be packing heat. It's a sign of the times. At the changing of the guard ceremony at Buckingham Palace these days, the Queen's guards need guarding by police officers who are dressed to kill. At the palace, at the train station, on the street, things have come a long way from the way they used to be. The British policeman does not carry a gun. A truncheon is his only weapon of defense. Not anymore. At least not for about 10% of the force now trained to carry arms, a number the government wants to increase. Which is why Ken Marsh of the Police Officers Federation is polling its members on whether they want to carry guns. I think the danger is very clear. If we carry guns, then those out there will carry guns and be more likely to use them. Yet recent truck attacks on the outdoor market in Germany and before that in France showed that police with guns can stop terrorists, if in both cases, not soon enough. Britain too has endured its own terror attacks, producing their own outcry for more protection. This is an argument between the way Britain imagines it used to be and the way it is now. Times have changed, society's changing, the world is changing, and we've got to act upon that. 
even at the palace. The twin blast struck during the evening rush hour near a government building in the Afghan capital. A target, a van carrying officials from Afghanistan's intelligence agency. A suicide attack followed by a car bomb took place, killing and injuring a number of people. Most of the victims are civilians. The second explosion came as first responders arrived to help. Several government officials are believed to be among the dead and wounded. Dozens were rushed to hospitals as security forces descended on the scene. The Taliban claimed responsibility immediately after the attack, confirming that the intelligence personnel were the target of the attack. To Turkey now, where Deputy Prime Minister Numan Kutumaz has said that police have killed a would-be suicide bomber who tried to enter the main police station in the southeastern province of Gaziantep. Security forces are conducting an operation to capture other suspected terrorists who fled the site. Police in Gaziantep were instrumental in cracking down on the flow of ISIL's foreign fighters into Syria. The province is located on the border with Syria and faces areas previously controlled by the militant group. Daesh terrorists have blown up a major gas plant in Syria which supplies one-third of the country's electricity. A UK-based Syrian opposition group said that the terrorists exploded the Hayyan gas plant in Homs province in the past 48 hours, putting it completely out of order. The report comes following a video released by the terror group on Sunday showing a man planting explosives in the plant and blowing it up. The plant which had been uh, seized, seized rather by the uh, terrorists used to produce 3.7 million cubic meters of natural gas per day. Since 2014, Daesh has seized several gas and oil fields in Syria, especially in the central and eastern parts of the country. Jordan is one of the four driest countries in the world, and climate change has hit the kingdom's agriculture sector. Farms use more than 65% of its water supply. Jordan is a landlocked country except at its southern border. It has only one river and its main source of water is rain, but that has been scarce in the past two decades. So together clouds, the Jordanian government has collaborated with German rainfall technology company WeatherTech. The company has built four cloud ionization towers in Jordan to emit icons into the atmosphere to encourage rainfall. Between May and July, the company induced rainfall five times and this could almost double by the end of the year. The technology relies on several factors such as humidity and wind to work properly. And experts believe under the right conditions, rainfall could fully be restored in Jordan. One of the things that a lot of people have assumed from all the recent rain in the West is that it's had to have been a cure-all for the multi-year drought, right? Well, that's actually a little bit of a stretch because it's actually going to take more than a few storms to officially end it. Now, we want to take all the destructive elements out of this. We're focusing specifically on the drought, not the loss of life the damage to property, anything like that, just the drought. Now, the snowpack, obviously, very important because California receives most of its precip in the winter. And then, of course, the snow melts when it warms up, supplying water for the summer. Now, of course, going back to the recent rainfall, that has certainly helped the lake and the reservoir levels to rise. Lake Oroville, for example, rose 31 feet in just two days. But to completely get all the reservoirs and the groundwater back to where it needs to be, it's likely going to take more than just one wet season. Flooding in southern Thailand affects more than a million people and leaves at least 25 dead. Flash flooding on Tuesday, January 10th, washed out a bridge on a main highway in Prachuap Kirikan province, causing a traffic jam that stretched for 125 miles. The government has already started building a temporary replacement bridge. Thailand's Deputy Chief Cha Chai Promlert said in a disaster update that 1.1 million people in 12 provinces have been affected by the flooding. Heavy rainfall usually stops in November, but has continued well into Thailand's dry season. Homes, schools, roads, and rubber and palm oil plantations have been damaged, and the flooding has affected 59 bridges. A hospital in Prachuap Kiri Khan was flooded, and many patients had to be moved. Thailand's Disaster Prevention and Mitigation Department said this is the worst flooding the area has seen in 50 years. As ocean temperatures have risen near the United States Pacific Northwest, researchers have linked the unusual increase in warmth to rising levels 
levels of a dangerous natural toxin in shellfish. The toxin, domoic acid, is produced by marine algae and can build up in seafood, which makes it harmful for humans to consume. Fishing bans are enforced when the acid reaches harmful levels. The U.S. National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration has now funded research to help scientists predict toxic outbreaks on a large scale. In Wisconsin, a Native American tribe has voted against the renewal of agreements that would allow Enbridge Inc. to use their land for a major crude oil pipeline, marking the latest sign of increasing opposition to North American energy infrastructure. The Bad River Band decided not to renew easements on Enbridge's Line 5 pipeline last week due to concerns over potential oil spills and called for the company to decommission and remove the 64-year-old pipeline. Bad River Tribal Chairman Robert Blanchard said, as many other communities have experienced, even a minor spill could prove to be disastrous for our people. Enbridge, a Calgary-based energy delivery company, said that talks over renewing the easement renewal have been ongoing since before 2013 and countered that the pipeline had operated safely through the reservation since 1953. Today we have a report on the teaching of Arabic in France's state schools. Most of the 55,000 or so students learning Arabic are the children of immigrants. Some conservatives saying the classes get in the way of integration, conservative politicians that is, while supporters argue the students are broadening their horizons. Arabic teachers are recruited abroad and paid by their country countries of origin. These are just some of the 55,000 pupils in France who study Arabic. The majority of them come from immigrant backgrounds. Learning Arabic is a way of staying in touch with their roots. But it's raised the question of whether they're being allowed to fully integrate into French society. The school day may be over, but for certain students, there's still an hour and a half to go. They're taking optional Arabic classes as part of a program founded in 1977 known as ELCO, or Teaching of Languages and Cultures of Origin. The Arabic courses are neither funded nor supervised by the French government. All the teachers are recruited in their countries of origin. The matter was even debated in French Parliament. The Teachings of Languages and Cultures of Origin program has gradually evolved from what it started as. Today it's a tool for identity withdrawal, and sometimes even, as the High Council of Integration has suggested, true Islamic catechisms. Don't you think that the introduction of native languages into the school curriculum encourages segregation and undermines national cohesion? A Swiss law requiring kids to attend co-ed swimming lessons just survived a challenge in the European Court of Human Rights. The case was brought by a Swiss family of Turkish origin who had been fined for refusing to send their two daughters to swim class with boys. The parents said the co-ed swim classes violated their beliefs as Muslims. But judges in Strasbourg ruled the goal of social integration was more important than the parents' wishes. They agreed the law interfered with religious freedom, but the interference wasn't ruled a human rights violation. Judges said the law was designed to protect foreign pupils from any form of social exclusion. Pakistan will count transgender people in its national census for the first time. The Lahore High Court issued the order on Monday, January 9th. The inclusion is due to a petition filed by Waqar Ali last November that cited the brutal torture of a transgender person by a gang of young men. Ali argued the fundamental rights of trans people should be recognized by including them in the national census. The move has been well received by Pakistan's transgender community. Transgender people have long been marginalized in Pakistan, but laws have passed in recent years giving them more rights. In 2011, a Supreme Court ruling said they could vote and get national identity cards with their transgender status. The next census is in March, nearly 19 years after the last census, when the population was 132 million. Analysts estimate it will have since passed 200 million. Job centers in most of the 19 Eurozone countries remain extremely busy nine years after the 2008 economic collapse. Data just published by Eurostat, the EU's statistical office, shows that there are 20.4 million people of working age in the EU who are unemployed, 15.8 million of whom live in the Eurozone. Youth unemployment rates are still very high in several countries. 
We asked citizens to share their views on the social consequences of the crisis. A lot of young people think about suicide. A lot, a lot of, uh, of uh, young people think uh, to the crime to sell drugs. And that's a big problem for the society. People don't even have money to, to buy heating. So uh, indeed, we, we know that it's not the same Europe that maybe our parents had experienced something that was evolving and getting better. It's a, there's a stagnation for sure. According to the latest official statistics, the overall youth unemployment rate has gone down. But in Greece, it is still running at 46.1%. In Spain, it is at 44.4%. Italy, 39.4%. And France, 25.9%. Dow Jones is out with a report that Walmart will be looking to cut hundreds more jobs, both at its headquarters as well as regional personnel that help manage the stores. This is right now is just according to a report, but you may remember that at the end of last year, Walmart also announced some job cuts that had to do with managing costs more effectively and some restructuring. So it's very possible that this is news that we could be hearing soon. Officially from Walmart, we've reached out and we'll let you know when they get back to us. U.S. President-elect Donald Trump is looking to China for job creation as looking for help from Alibaba chairman Jack Ma. Ma told the president-elect that his e-commerce network is able to channel U.S. products to the Chinese and Asian markets. Both seem confident that the effort will benefit small businesses. Yes, we had a great meeting. It's jobs. You just saw what happened with Fiat, where they're going to build a massive plant in the United States in Michigan. And we're very happy. And Jack and I are going to do some small great business. things. Uh, small business, right? Just we'll focus business. on small business. Thank you, Thank you so much. There are a number of U.S. products on sale at Alibaba's T-Mobile platform, ranging from everyday groceries, skincare, to jewelry and clothing. Ma has encouraged more farmers and clothing makers to explore Chinese markets. The plan aims to bring a million small U.S. businesses to the online mall and help each business add one position over the next five years. The companies will sell their products directly to Chinese consumers. No, we are specifically talking about we will create, uh, you know, uh, supporting one million small business, especially in the Midwest of America. Small business on the platform selling products, agricultural products and American services to uh, China and Asia.